They're taking to the streets, fighting to get their money back after betting on Chinese companies aiming for U.S. listings. Bloomberg's Margaret Conley reports. Give me back my blood and sweat money. The sign reads, another calls for a public hearing. One man has attempted suicide. These are the pleas of outraged Chinese investors who say they have been scammed. It doesn't take long for the police to shut them down. Retired factory worker Lu Ya Fang shows us ads used to lure in her and as many as half a million Chinese. I was cheated of nearly $19,000, and that is all I have. As a disabled person in such a society, I don't make much money. Chinese investors bet their life savings on companies with the promise of U.S. listings, some of the same companies that later cost U.S. investors billions of dollars. Companies gained stock market listings abroad and lost value. Because of reverse merger rules, they weren't subject to the same level of scrutiny that might have warmed off investors. Dozens of firms who have sold shares to Chinese investors, including some that have listed in the U.S., are from here in Xi'an. This is one of China's oldest cities, and it strives to be a high-tech economy. Local officials set up the Shanxi exchange that facilitated share selling, but they never had the authority to do so and the central government later deemed the practice illegal. Wang Weimin, a former exchange official, helped promote trading in the region. Xi'an needs funding to develop. We show how Xi'an will develop the people, and whoever wants to make a fortune will naturally come. Money was poured into companies like China Natural Gas, which listed on the New York Nasdaq and raised over $75 million. Most who invested in loss say they haven't seen a cent. A company executive claims most domestic investors accepted one yuan a share. China Natural Gas also faces a lawsuit in the U.S. Local regulators didn't return our calls and officials wouldn't comment. The reality is that the, the system here is set up in a way that there are a lot of opportunities for people to, um, uh, you know, conduct fraudulent activity. So it's not, a, it's not the credibility of China, per se, but it is certainly the credibility of the Chinese government. As well as the lives of those like Lu Yafang, who reads from a letter so far unanswered. Dear Premier Wen, please save us old people who were cheated and relieve us from the pain and let us feel the warmth of justice. Margaret Conley Bloomberg, Xi'an. For more on investing in China, let's bring in Kevin Pollack, Managing Director at Paragon Capital, an investment firm that's focused on China and based here in New York City. Also joining me from the newsroom is my colleague Zara Burton. Thank you both. Kevin, uh, you just watched that report by my colleague Margaret Conley. Why aren't reverse merger rules in China more stringent? And I should say that earlier this month, concerns about reverse mergers prompted the NYSE Euronext to file with the SEC plans to tighten the listing requirements for reverse merger companies following allegations of accounting fraud. Well, let me start by saying that it's terrible what happened to these investors. And essentially, uh, promoters that were unscrupulous sold them stock in private companies and promised them that they were going to go public in the U.S. and they were going to make lots of money. And that didn't materialize for them. Uh, these in companies did ultimately, uh, many of them, go public in the United States through reverse mergers and IPOs. And many of those companies uh, have done very well. So I don't think it's fair for those uh, Chinese investors to blame the reverse merger process because of the reverse merger process, those companies were able to achieve a high valuation, attract capital, have the benefits of being a publicly traded company, which include uh, stock options and incentives for employees and also using stock for acquisitions and having the prestige. Uh, the reverse merger process is certainly a faster process than an IPO, but companies that do this have to get a two-year PCOB audit done and there are other disclosures that have to be made. Uh, the key is uh, diligence has to be done. Yeah. Kevin, it's Zara Burton here um, in the newsroom. And I just want to follow up on what you said. Maybe some of these Chinese investors who are blaming reverse mergers for some of their losses, U.S. investors would maybe agree, some U.S. investors would agree with those Chinese investors as well. What is the SEC's role in all this? We know that they're working with Chinese regulators to rein in some of the unscrupulous practices. But what does the SEC need to do to limit losses for U.S. investors who are interested in China 
but clearly don't want to be investing in a sham company. Yeah, the key here is disclosure and transparency by companies. And I believe a lot of these companies have stepped it up and improved their transparency and disclosure to investors. That's the real concern here is making sure these companies are giving full information and that there aren't uh, issues that investors should know about. So uh, it is uh, good that companies uh, are now required yeah, to... Yeah, but Kevin, can I just ask you this? Yes. You're talking about disclosure, and in a lot of cases, maybe they did disclose. But let's face it, some of these same exact companies have operations over in China. If they fail the U.S. investor, the U.S. investor doesn't have the ability to necessarily recover some of their losses because some of these Chinese assets are abroad and not here. Well, it's critical to do diligence on these companies, and I think there's still some tremendous opportunities for investors right now for various reasons. Uh, if there is an issue where uh, there's a problem at a company, it is is possible to get a recovery. I have seen that happen before. But the key is to do good diligence from the start, know who you're dealing with, uh, and not every investor is best suited to do that. And unfortunately, these mm -hmm. investors didn't have the information or the ability to do the level of diligence that was required, and yeah. they were hurt because uh, they weren't able to sell out. And that had nothing to do with the reverse merger process. That was more about Chinese government rules, these dubious promoters, and some of the parties yeah. involved in these deals. And Kevin, speaking of due diligence, you are in favor of that so-called seasoning period so the public can receive assurances that a company's operation operations and financial reporting are reliable. What are the pluses and minuses of a seasoning period? And should it be discussed when U.S. and Chinese regulators meet in Washington this fall? I think it should be discussed when regulators meet. It's uh, very good that there's a seasoning process because it will weed out some of the potential bad players that could otherwise become listed in the big exchanges. Now companies have to wait six months to a year or more before they can uplist to the NYSE, AMX, and NASDAQ. And actually, I think that's something that could be applauded. I do think one year might be a bit on the long end because some of these companies are very strong. They're overlooked by the banks doing IPOs, and they can't raise capital uh, otherwise. And there is an advantage to being uh, on those higher exchanges. So it does punish some companies that are attractive. Kevin, Zara here again. You know, when I've covered a number of these companies that have come out with maybe some accounting problems, you and I have spoken many times. This week we were speaking about Tudo. This is one of those companies that you said that you did not invest in. It was a Chinese IPO. It came out and immediately fell on the NASDAQ. The question I have for you is, when does it become more feasible to start investing again in Chinese-based companies? Because as you pointed out to me, there was Ren Ren, there was China Deng Deng, all these companies that came out, and yes, they were applauded at first, but then they just went down. Yes, I'm a, I'm a big China bull, and where else you need a growth of 8 or 9% per year? So I think China is the place to be. I am, however, a bear on the internet IPOs of Chinese companies. They've performed terribly. Most of them are down more than 10%. I think the real opportunity today is the smaller cap Chinese companies. These are trading at ridiculously low valuations due to short seller attacks, negativity in the media. There have been a few select frauds as well. So they can be picked up for attractive prices. And even more importantly, there's a great catalyst for buying those stocks today because private equity firms are stepping up in two different ways. Some private equity firms are making investments at a premium into these companies. Like Morgan Stanley just made an investment of $100 million into Chinese China XD Plastics, and in addition, other private equity firms are making bids to buy out uh, these companies. They're trading at such ridiculously low multiples, it makes sense to take them private, grow them, and take them public elsewhere at a much higher mm -hmm. valuation. And that actually was the case with China Natural Gas, one of the companies mentioned today. Uh, I'm on the phone with these private equity investors all the time. I was just on the phone with ABAX, who's in the process of taking Harbin Electric private. And I think you're going to see a lot more activity. Yeah. So that's a great catalyst to invest in these companies. Uh, Kevin, in our last minute, you did just mention Morgan. We learned yesterday Morgan Stanley cut its economic growth estimate for China next year. What type of impact might that have on stock valuations? I think right now the uh, U.S. listed Chinese companies are trading at such ridiculously low valuations that it shouldn't have much of an impact uh, in that universe. Companies often are trading below cash or even at one or two times that income, uh, it's as if companies are all trading uh, as if people don't believe they really have what they have. And it's really unfair for the good companies out there. So I don't think that that slash in growth is going to impact a lot of these companies. Yeah. However, uh, I think these companies can benefit from private equity firms giving them injections of capital to grow. And that's something I've been helping companies uh, accomplish and improve their corporate governance so they can attract that capital. Kevin Pollack, Managing Director of Paragon Capital, and my colleagues Zara Burton joining me as well. Thank you both.